more about the Lord. And, uh, and then you go to break occasionally when he's good away and get refreshed. And that's what I told him. Don't worry about this place for a few days. And of course, he attacks it every few minutes. And what's going on? And why does this happen? It's kind of funny, but uh, we all need a little time away occasionally. And, but not wait for the Lord, but just a uh, time to reflect and a time to hear somebody else. That's what he's doing also. Having said that, um, uh, you know, Paul reminded me, and of course we got to finish a little earlier than I thought, but Paul reminded me the other day what Bailey Sadler used to say all the time, uh, you go ahead and preach as long as you want to, brother, but now we all leave at 12 o'clock. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of understand what Paul's saying, and I'm not talking about the apostle Paul either. <laughs> 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 Having said that, uh, if you'll turn your Bibles to Psalm 91, and uh, we'll look at 91, and I think I'll read all 16 verses of Psalm 91. And when you're turning there, uh, you know, one of the, the great things about Psalm 91, and some people have called it the 911 Psalm. It's like, if you call 911, you go to Psalm 91, verse 1, and you get a a great blessing just from the first scripture in chapter 91 of Psalm. So, uh, having said that, we need to understand that the whole Psalm all ties together, and I'm going to try to explain at least uh, to go through 10 verses of it, and I go through the rest of it according to how what time allows, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start. But I'll read all that scripture first, and we'll see how far we can get through that. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, or the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge of you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread among, upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall uh, trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and, and honor him with long time. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's go to the Lord. Tim, because it's so much in the scripture, it's just an encouragement to all of us, and we pray that you will help us to understand and know more about you through this psalm. And I just pray that you bless me this morning. Help me to uh, connect with these people and to help them to understand and help me as well, Lord, as you already have. And I pray if there's one here today that's lost, that today will be the day of salvation. And we just ask that you would bless and be with each one here. I pray if there's one here that is lost, that you would be working in their hearts uh, as we speak, Lord. And I just pray that you receive honor and glory for what's about to happen. And we just praise you for all you do as we ask this and pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right. And like I said, this is one of the most popular psalms, if you haven't read it, and this is. Uh, it's uh, a psalm of hope, joy, peace. It's got basically everything that we need as Christians to, to help us to be all we can be. Because if we trust in the Lord what we need to, then, you know, we, we have a better understanding. We talked about Job, and I'm going to use a little bit of Job this morning in a little bit different context than what Sunday school lesson was. But, uh, through this psalm, uh, and, and like I said, some have called it 911 psalm, and there's other places in the Bible that you get encouragement and you can get the promises of God, but this is important. And Psalm 1, as I said, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, 
you know, it's just a, it's a shelter of the Most High. The Most High here and God's name means so many different things. And the Hebrew language, when they say this, and use different things like Most High, Almighty God, uh, Lord, Big L, smaller uh, capital O R D, it means something else. Had and I, but all those names mean something. And sometimes we don't always see that in the scripture. We just read it and look at it. <coughs> so I'm gonna try to uh, hit on that a little bit. In this case, most high here is Elion, which means supreme one. He owns heaven and earth. He created everything that is, everything that exists, and he's Lord of all of it. And that's something we don't always see. We, we say it, we understand it, but that word actually means that he is the supreme creator of everything. He owns it all. He did it. It belongs to him. And when we talk about a secret place, we're talking about a place that we can go for comfort. You know, and does everybody, does all Christians, or do all Christians have access to that question? Now, if you read some uh, commentaries and look at some of the scripture, and I've done that a lot, trust me, I've listened to a lot of sermons about this. Uh, some of those sermons would say that only those people that are, quote, where you need to be, if you're close to the Lord and you're doing what you need to be, you have access to that holy holy. It's like the mercy seat. And other people would say it's available to all. But do we take advantage of it? That's the question. Do you take advantage of that secret place? And I'll let you think about that a little bit. And I'm going to tell you that you know, the secret place, that's where God is. And if we want to feel safe, we want to feel comfort, comforted, well, that's where we need to be also. And not just occasionally go there, but something that we need to think about and we need to be seeking that place, that secret place of God. I'll tell you what Charles Spurgeon, he's a great preacher in the 1800s. I've got something else at the end. If we have time, I'd like to read that he wrote about the turmoil that he had and some of the struggles he went through also. And he's one of the greatest preachers. And if you ask Brother Slade, he's one of his favorites. And rightly so. He, he was a very good preacher in London, England in the 1800s. We had 1800s to uh, he passed away later. But, uh, this is what he says about this scripture. Every child of God looks toward the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat. Yet all do not dwell in the most holy place. They run to it at times and enjoy occasionally approaches but they do not habitually reside in mysterious places. Now, my question is, are you one of those that just run in the dark, in and out, when you have troubles and turmoils, sickness, death, uh, some kind of strife that's going on in your life? Do you go to God in those times only? Or are you trying to get into this secret place that we're talking about all the time? Certainly, if we're there all the time, <coughs> How much better off it will be? How much easier is it for us to go through those things? And we all go through them. And sometimes unexpected, as we talked about Job. Job didn't understand who God was because he thought God was good. We were talking about it earlier, like a few minutes ago. Uh, Job thought God was all good because Job had never seen anything bad in his life. He prospered. If you read Job, you see that he had just thousands of livestock. Uh, nine or ten children, like ten, uh, great dwelling place, a house, all that was taken away from him, gone in a matter of minutes. He didn't know that God. He knew that God was good all the time. He didn't know that God was going to allow Satan to try him out and see how tough he was. So that, that was hard for him. He had a hard time with that. But God was with him and he got redeemed in the end. So, And in the second part of that verse, the shadow of the Almighty, El Shaddai, were all sufficient. Another word for God. Uh, he's our protector. He's, he protects us from evil. From you know, the Bible talks about being hot, as uh, we see sometimes from storms. He shelters us from those. He takes care of us. And when we're in trouble, God is there for us. Do we take advantage of that when we're in trouble? Uh, certainly, at a certain point, we do. And uh, you know, that's a good thing. I'm glad that at least you go, or we all go occasionally. And I hope that we go more often than just when we're in trouble. But, you know, regardless of all this, uh, you know, thank God that he's still all we ever need. He's there for us. He's available to us. And we, not to say we don't have trouble. I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying here. And, and this happens. You know, we, I just, we went through the snake thing and some of that scripture's in. I don't know if we'll get that far, but 
the, the pastor over in Parkersville or somewhere uh, just passed away because he got snake bitten by a rattlesnake. And uh, the doctor told him if you don't get that treatment, you're going to die. 45 minutes later, he's dead. That's tempting God. Uh, I don't know how you get around that, but uh, certainly they take some scripture and do, don't apply it to the whole Bible, and you have to do that. But this is, uh, when we talk about Job, and I, I did something on Job because uh, when we go through the trouble, as Job did, after he lost everything he had, I mean, he had and he had a lot. He was a rich man. All his children, all his livestock, all his wealth. And he actually wished that he'd never been born, if you remember the scripture. And he was given counsel by his three buddies. Not always very good counsel. We'll probably talk about that a little bit. But Eliphaz said this in chapter 5. He said, in verse 7, he says, Yet man is born to trouble, and sparks fly upward. But as for me, I would seek God. And to God I would commit my cause. Who does great things and, and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? There is no better advice than that. He, Eliphaz gave him, gave Job great advice there. And I, you know, we can use that same advice. Seek God. You know, and, and to God, commit your cause, whatever it is. If you're having problems, take it to the Lord. And he, he says he does great things, unsearchable, marvelous things. Now that's saying something. And God's there for us. And not everything always goes according to how we want it to go and how we plan it to go, but it goes. And God's in control. So basically what he's telling Job is, you need to go to God without doing all this quarreling with yourself of what went on and what's going on and why is this happening to me. And he did a lot of that. He did a lot of soul searching my grave. But you need to go to the Lord. And it's pretty good advice. You know, Paul, uh, Apostle Paul, not Brother Paul, Apostle Paul uh, went through uh, beatings, he was shipwrecked, he was cold, naked, hungry. He went through it all. Uh, he was snake bitten once, you know, remember that. Uh, they don't beat you 30 times in old days, they only whip you 39 because they were afraid to kill you. You know, that now. So 39 lashes he got uh, five different times. He got beaten with rods uh, three or four times. And like I said, he was hungry. He, he did without sometimes, and sometimes he says he had plenty. But he struggled also. And you know the thing that we always remember and need to remember and always say is, but God. And when you think about but God, or you say but God, we understand that God can do anything. Even through all this, but God can take care of that. He can take care of us too. Is it available to everybody? Certainly, uh, it's available to all Christians. Now, where do we take advantage of it is our fault. If we don't take advantage of what God gives us, you can't blame it on God. You have to blame it on yourself because He's there. He's available to us. Now, I'm not saying that everything, you know, goes the, always the way we want it. Uh, but a lot of Christians don't seek to be close, and uh, you know. <coughs> Is it available to all Christians? Yeah, I'm glad like you asked, but you know, it is. It's there for us, so we need to take advantage of it. You know, don't just go to the Lord. The whole, the, the whole sentence or the, the thinking here is, don't just run to the Lord when you're in trouble, but use the Lord all the time. I pray that you do that. I, you know, I find myself sometimes, when, when, you know, I, I really spend a lot of time with this. I don't know how slate does it all the time, how much you do it all the time, but it's pretty tough when you, you know, I, I knew what I was doing a week ago, or maybe a week and a half ago, when he asked me, uh, I've already seen him put that, and I've been studying it, and I've been looking at it, it's hours upon hours for me. It doesn't come easy, but the Lord's <coughs> question, and I know that every time I get off track a little bit, I think, what's going on, and I, I would think, every time I go to study, I didn't pray. I didn't ask God to help me in the Scripture. So I stopped. And that's the same way with us. We need to ask the Lord to help us all the time. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes we just do things without thinking or without planning anything. And we ought to ask the Lord even in the little things. And I know that uh, there's scripture that will show you that God has taken care of you. He shouldn't have to, if you're where you ought to be, He shouldn't have to give every little thing you need to do, what's right and what's wrong. We ought to have a pretty good idea of what that is. Because we're close to the Lord and we're reading His Word. We ought to have an idea of what's right and what's wrong. So you can't blame it all on just 
you know, there's very lot of stuff that we need to pray about. And a lot of things that we do without thinking. In verse 2, uh, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I put trust. And, you know, when the Lord talks about a refuge, uh, it's, a, it's a place that we can go to for protection. And there's more in this scripture about all that, but He's my refuge and my fortress. The word here, Lord, is Yahweh. The word Yahweh is used a lot in the Old Testament. That's the word that uh, for God that the, they wouldn't even write. They didn't even put any any uh, consonants in it or vowels. They just used consonants. Is all. That's what I'm talking mainly. But, uh, Yahweh in Hebrew, which means I am that I am. That's what he told Moses. Just go tell him who sent me. You go tell him I am that I am. That means that God always was. He is and he always will be. Now you think about that. And it's hard to explain. You know, Wednesday night I mentioned as we was talking uh, after the prayer meeting Wednesday night in the Bible uh, study. I was talking about why or how come, which is obvious if you think about it, but nobody in Old Testament or New Testament tried to prove God. It's, it's a given. God is who he is. I am what I am. He was there from the beginning. He started it and he'll finish it. And nobody tried to prove who God was. Now today there are all kinds of people trying to disprove who God is, trying to say, you know, atheists all the time, but who's really an atheist? And you start questioning that. Why does they care if they're an atheist? Why do they care and try to prove God doesn't exist? Which is interesting. But he always was. He is now and continues to be and will be forever. So that's something we need to remember. I am what I am. My God in Him I trust. The trust comes through Jesus Christ. He's trustworthy. The thing here is that, and Slate's told this several times, that, and he talks about the preacher. You can't put your faith in the preacher. You put him on a pestle and he'll fall right on top of it. Well, there's no difference in us. If we put our faith, in, and we certainly can put our faith to some extent in each other, I hope. But when you trust in man instead of trusting in the Lord, you get in trouble. Because man will fail. God will not fail. He's never failed. Nothing he's ever said has not come to pass with the exception of the end of the book. We know where that's going. And, you know, we can trust him because he's, he's done everything he said. And he continues to do it. And he still works. And I'll show you some of that in a little bit with Jesus Christ and how he works. And as we go on, my God, you know, my trust, God here is Elohim. Elohim is plural for God. You see it in Genesis 1, it refers to the Trinity. That's what it's talking about. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God may deliver us from disease. He may not. You know, that's something else that we get into. Uh, we don't know that. But as, uh, as I said, you know, there's a lot of promises in this. And we can go to Him even in the time of trouble. In verse 3, uh, continuing, Surely he, was, he shall deliver me uh, from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And that's not the easy to say. But, we will have problems. We will have disease. We'll have things going our life. It talks about the power snare. Now, they didn't have guns in these days when they was writing this in the Psalms. They didn't know what that was. So in order to catch birds, they had to sneak up on that, do every kind of trick they, they knew. They used nets. They used all kinds of things to trap a bird. And that's what this is referring to. But it's talking about, in this case, it's Satan. And Satan will use any kind of snare that he can uh, to deceive you, to cause you to do something that, that would, you know, look bad on you as a Christian, the church, uh, anything that would go against the Lord. And it happens, folks. I mean, it happens. Uh, people make mistakes, you know, and I, I see it. Uh, it happens all the time. It talks about pestilence may take our mortal life here in this scripture. But that pestilence that we... Uh, see, and you know, there's a lot of that, especially in this time, and then later on, as I was talking about with Charles Spurgeon, uh, some of those things are not as prevalent now, at least in, uh, you know, there are some in third world countries, but uh, not as much in developed countries, because they have vaccines and so forth, but it used to be a real problem. But, you know, as we were talking this morning, as we grow older, uh, we've seen a lot of sickness in our time, I mean, all our, my Sunday school class, I don't think anybody over is 
exempt or have been exempt from being sick or having some kind of problem. And several of us have almost died in an old time or two and had something going on, whether it be cancer or blood disease or whatever it might be, heart attacks. And, and we've all been through something just about, every one of us. Breathing problems, you name it, my class has been through it. So if you need any counseling with any of those things, uh, I believe we could probably help you because we've been there and done that. But, you know, we all were growing older and we see more death and more sickness all the time. And uh, it's something that just happens as we go forward. I mean, it's, we can't help it. Uh, it's something that comes with life. As Slate says, 10 out of 10 die. You know, there's no way out of this life alive unless the Lord comes back. Continuing on in verse 4, He shall cover you with feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. <coughs> his truth shall be a shield and a buckler. Now, in this scripture, you've got... You've heard it illustrated time and time again, I'm sure, uh, at least most of us, about how either a forest, you know, uh, a forestry official has been in the forest and after the forest has burned, got the fire put out, or they responded to a barn fire and they talk about a hen uh, being in that fire that's completely burned up and they go over and keep the hen over and there's little chicks from out. Which is pretty interesting. I heard the story more than once, so I'd say that that really has happened a few times. If the fire is not really intense, that that hen stays there. Now, you know, God talks about He shall cover you with His feathers, and the comparison here is not really about the feathers, if you will. It's more about uh, the sacrificial love of Christ. The implication here is that, that God loved us so much. Now, he does give us a refuge. He does cover us with his wings. It doesn't mean feathers left. This is tough stuff, but he does. I mean, he really can take care of us. When you think about feathers, it doesn't sound good. But, but God's there for us, and he does protect us with refuge. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is, he, he's responsible for our soul. And when we get saved, see, then Jesus Christ takes care of us. And we Slate talks about eternal security or the security of the believer. And once you're saved, you're saved. Uh, you know, if you're truly saved, then you're saved. And God won't let you, you know, Jesus said, if, he, if I don't turn you loose, then Jesus, he's going to be in, we'll be in Jesus' hand, but God's got us all, and he's not going to turn loose of us. And I messed that paraphrase that, but uh, you understand and you've heard it before. But God is always there for us, and that's the thing we need to get out of this. He makes great promises here. He's going to cover us with his feathers or his wings and we can take refuge. And we need refuge sometimes. You know, it's just like I told Slade, you know, it's good that you get away from me. You know, there's stuff that goes on here every day. And I know some of y'all don't get into the, the everyday stuff, but there's things going on all the time. I mean, if it's somebody sick or in the hospital, uh, you know, somebody passed away or uh, somebody needs help, somebody calls complaining. I know you don't believe that, but that does happen occasionally. You know, uh, and I know it's not any of you, somebody's not here today. <laughs> he goes on to say, and I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the shield and the buckler. And of course, the shield, it talks about fire darts in this in this chapter also. And uh, the buckler, uh, what's that mean? And uh, it, it says, you know, it talks about the truth of God. It, it's standard for all truth. I mean, if you want real truth, then you go to God for real truth. You know, the world will tell you all kinds of things. And, you know, what one thinks is right is not right with God. The truth with God is different than what the truth of the world is. So you remember that what people tell you is not always right. They're telling you what they think. If it feels good, do it. Don't do it. That's not right. But God's Word is true. It's right. And you can go to this Word. And I remember Dale used to say, when you hold up the Bible like that and shake it, <laughs> not what that does, but that bothers that house. <laughs> God's word is true. And that's our truth. That's where we get our, our truth from. You want to know what's true? You look this. Don't listen to what the world says. Don't watch these crazy commercials. They'll have you all bad shape. The buckler talks about a touch, and the buckler is, you know, the best I can understand is a surrounding. It's a protection all around. And, uh, you know, that thing we need to remember is we go through this world. We will face trials and tribulations and trouble. We're not exempt from that. It's going to happen to us. But with God, 
but God is with us. So we need to remember that. And, you know, <laughs> the thing is, as we go through those things and we trust in the Lord, the next time we go through them, it becomes a little bit easier. You know, one of the, the commentary writer of the lesson for today, and we did the lesson today because I was busy, but uh, the commentary writer was talking about his father in law. I don't know if anybody read it, but uh, it was a book or a Sunday school material. He was talking about his father in law, who was seven years old, found out he had cancer, and he's dying from cancer. And, and he finally asked him, as he was really getting sick, he said, How are you handling this? Are you okay? He said, yeah. He said, uh, he said you know, God doesn't know me any favor. I know that. I mean, that's something we need to remember. God's sovereign. God does what he wants to. You know, we talk about the question of God. That's fine. You know, Job questioned God. God questioned Job. I believe in the commentary said 77 times God asked Job questions in nature anyway. He doesn't have to. What right do you have, you know, to, to question God? Well, certainly we have some right because we want to know what's going on, but be careful how you ask those questions. You know, you got to ask the question to God, of God in the right manner, and it has to be uh, in a godly way, if you know what I mean. You can't just be mad for them and, and why did you do this, or that kind of attitude. Can I, Can I get some kind of affirmation about what's going on? And when you go to this word, you're going to probably find out what's happening in your life. And like I said, uh, you know, if worse comes to worse, and you don't make it, and this is something I have to deal with when I went through prostate cancer, that, you know, if we leave this world and you're saved, you're going to be with the Lord. And, you know, we're, we're going to a better place than Bob talks about. So, anyway, we, we have a lot of needs, and our needs range from uh, maybe just a simple hug to putting a double bump lock on your door. I don't know what it is. And I, I actually almost put and carrying a 38, but I didn't do that. So, uh, whatever the text is, but the Lord is our God, we remember that. And He's our, in all of our needs, where there's something easy, I mean, it might just be a hug, you know, a little hug to somebody, or uh, make an encouraging word. You know, it, it's interesting that, that I got a couple of text messages, you know, telling me that, uh, just encouraging, I guess, for today. And sometimes we need encouragement. I called a friend of mine yesterday, and I, I wrote a note about that, so I'll forget it. I don't even work that now. But uh, I called a friend yesterday that's had some problems lately like and got into some trouble. Great guy. I mean, it happens. He, he got into a little trouble, and uh, I called him yesterday and talked to him a little bit. He's so appreciative of it. And he sent me a couple of texts even after it hung up. And thank me. And I, I got him a note somewhere about how. Uh, you know, we, we, we have problems sometimes. And when we go through those problems and we make mistakes, it, you know, we, we ought to be less condemning, less, you know, pointing the finger at somebody because we go through things ourselves. We do things that God doesn't like. And I asked the question before, and I, I you know, again, at what point do we, you know, we want God to do something with these people? We talked about that also this morning in, in the lesson. But, uh, you know, God deals with those problems eventually. Now, we may not see it when we think somebody's prospering, but they're going to get their just desserts or their rewards, and that's in Scripture also. But, you know, God's going to take care of that. It's not our place. So, when you're condemning somebody, you're thinking, well, I can't believe they did that. Whatever it might be, think about what you've done, and what if God decided to discipline us every time we mess up immediately? Instead of having the compassion and the love that he does, he wait on us to straighten us. What if he, can, what if he can just did something to us? He will chastise us. But what if he came down hard on us every time we made a mistake? Like we're doing some of these other That wouldn't be a pretty big word. So, uh, God can, can provide those things for us if we're just willing to ask him to trust him. Now, God is true. Uh, in him you can find refuge. And, you know, like I said, God works even through death, and we see that. Uh, and I'm going to read 5, 6, and 7 because they're kind of tied together, and I'm going to make a point for those also. Uh, start with 5. You shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. 
uh, by the terrorists and the house barrels today, pest on some walks in the dark and the destruction of noonday. So he names four four time periods there, all four of them. And, and all four of them are to let us know that we're secure no matter what time of the day it is. Basically is what that is. We're secure in the Lord, no matter if it's night, day, evening, noontime, it doesn't matter. And that's the thing. In verse 7, uh, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right side, and at your right hand, and it shall come near, not come near you. And these are just, uh, there's all kinds of examples of plagues and pestilence like I was talking about, especially in the 15, 16, 17, 1800s. You can just go look at thousands and thousands of people that died from plagues, blue bonnet, black plague, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, a lot of people just, you know, just went on. They had nothing. They couldn't figure out what it was. They didn't know. They guessed a lot of times, and it was really tough. But only God knows who's going to survive those things. And, you know, that's, he's sovereign. I mean, that's it's up to him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8, and this is a thing we need to remember. This is what Paul said. Uh, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Well pleased, he said. So Paul said, Christians, you know, we'd be better off. You know, we can't uh, shorten our life. We don't want to do that. That's not biblical either. But uh, we'd be better off if we were gone from here and in heaven with the Lord. And so that's something else to think about. And uh, I'm kind of hurt. Uh, verse 8 says, Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Uh, and now, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. And in 8 and 9, uh, you know, that's where I, I had originally thought about the swift justice because of how God works and you know, what, what we do uh, when it comes to trying to judge people or, you know, condemn people, I guess, not making them say uh, Like I said, praise God, He's slow to anger and He's merciful, He's compassionate, He loves us. And, uh, you know, what a great mighty God we serve. And, you know, the thing is, you know, verse 10 says, No evil shall befall us. I'm going to tell you this, my friend. But uh, Charles Spurgeon tells him to church him, and that's the one I was talking about. It's an uh, uh, outbreak of cholera, and I know what caused it, and they carried it out later, and they got a monument up and all that. There's like 500 died in a small area of London and close to where he breeds. And as I quote, pick up where he was talking about, family after family, family surrounded me to the bedside of the smith. And almost every day I was called to visit the grave. I gave myself up with youthful adder to the visitation of the sick and was sent from, uh, from all corners of the district by persons to all ranks and religion. Nobody's exempt. See, that's the thing he's saying right there. I became weary in the body and sick at heart. My friends seemed falling one by one, and I felt uh, or fancied that I was sickening like those around me. A little more work and weeping would have laid me low among the rest. I felt that my burden was heavier than I could bear, and I was ready to sink under it. As God would have it, I was returning mournfully home from the funeral when my curiosity led me to read a paper which was uh, wafered up on the shoemaker's window um, in Dover Road. He asked the judge, what was that? It did not look like a trade announcement, nor was it. For it bore in good, bold handwriting these words, because the Lord has, because thou has made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high my habitation, there shall be no evil befall me, neither shall the plague come nigh my dwelling. The effect upon my heart was immediate, he said. When he read the word that this shoemaker's wife, widow, had put on the window, and it's that scripture, he was lifted up immediately. We read the word sometimes, aren't we lifted up? I mean, there's, you know, there's some up there that just picks us up and helps us in times of trouble when we're stressed out or whatever might be going on. And faith, faith appropriate to this message as their own. Uh, I felt secure, refreshed, and uh, girt with immortality. In other words, he was ready to go back and start again. He was ready to do more funerals, go to people that were sick, which he did. I felt no fear of evil. 
you know, and I suffered no harm. The providence, and that's what it is, providence of God. He didn't just happen to be in the and look over here and see the scripture that he needs to see out of Psalm 91. But God had that there for him, and he sent him down that road to see that sign and to help him out. That's why when we turn our Bibles, we pray to the Lord and ask him what we need to look at, what we need to go today. And you start reading, you'll see something you need. And almost without fail. Sometimes we, you know, we don't go to the Lord first. We may not get all that. But the psalmist in these verses assures a man who dwells in God that he is secure. And that's the great thing. And I am with this. Uh, is God your refuge? We can do it. You know, is God your shelter? You can be. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can know these promises. If you don't know the Lord, then you need to become, or you need to come forward and ask the Lord to forgive you. You need to understand that these promises don't block people a lot. They try to claim them sometimes, but they're for us, and they're only for us if we seek the Lord and go to Him for it. It's not just like he lays it on us because he feels like it. It's because we ask him, we seek him, we go to him. So if you're not saved, you can't do that. The, the prayers that are sent up by the Christians uh, are for you, for those that are lost. And, uh, you know, that's the hope you have. And we, that's another lesson for another time in John 9.31. And uh, there's God here to prayer of the sinner. And uh, certainly if you're asking him to forgive you, he does. And I pray that if you're lost today, that today would be that day of salvation for you, that you'd come forward accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It just means that you believe in your heart, that you repent of your sins, that you turn around, start the other direction. And ask the Lord to forgive you. Believe that He died for you on the cross and was buried, and that God raised Him in three days, as the Bible says. Thank you all for your attention and for your invitation.